Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining Autism BC Talks. Today, our topic is autism and estate planning, and it's a part two with uh, Jeffrey White. Um, I'm going to give an introduction of Jeff first before we go into the detail. So uh, Jeffrey White has more than 25 years of expertise in will, estate, and trust matters. He's recognized with a, count, uh, with a title of King's Counsel, uh, which is an ex uh, recognized his exceptional merit in his profession. Um, Jeff also represented Disability Alliance of BC at the Supreme Court of Canada in 2018. Um, he works in Kelowna and also in downtown Vancouver. So he has to travel. Um, also he's recognized by the best lawyers in Canada for estates and trust. So he has many um, achievements. You can read um, the slides that he's going to show. And this, is, uh, this talk will be recorded. So you can watch it again on our YouTube ch uh, channel after this talk. Um, today, our talk will focus on representation agreement and power of attorney, and also uh, the importance of capacity and private committees. Uh, Jeff is going to start the presentation by answering the questions. Uh, some people asked last time, but those questions are not answered. It's about trusts and also how to choose trustees. Um, the presentation will be one hour, and after the hour, uh, Jeff is going to um, answer the question until 12, 12 p.m. So there will be half an hour for uh, questions. If you have any questions, you're welcome to put that in our chat and I'll collect all your questions and ask Jeff after his presentation for about an hour. So I'll give the time to you, Jeff. Great, thank you, Stella. Um, it's uh, great to be here with everyone, um, and uh, I think we had a, a pretty good session last time, um, and as Stella mentioned, this is part two of the two-part session. I think probably a, a number of uh, the folks on today were at that first session, um, and as Stella mentioned, that session was focused on the, um, uh, the wills and estates and trust side. So what do we do when we're planning for parents um, and inheritances? and what's the importance of having um, those inheritances protected into trusts rather than just being going directly um, and, uh, and doing it that way. And so we, we gave a lot of basic information and then we answered some questions uh, and we had a lot of questions um, and we had a few left over. And so as Stella said, um, uh, we committed to being able to uh, off top today uh, to answer some of those questions. And so I'm just gonna run through them um, and provide a little bit of answers. It'll probably take us about five or 10 minutes. Uh, and then we'll jump into the theme for today, uh, which you can see on the screen is uh, for planning for the future. So representation agreements, uh, powers of attorney, and just supportive and substituted decision-making. So some of the questions from the last webinar. So the first question is, uh, what is the best time to set up a trust for an autistic child, uh, not knowing their, their abilities uh, in the future? Um, and that is a, is a difficult um, one to answer and a difficult situation because um, we, we don't know um, whether where the person will fit in terms of what their abilities are uh, when they turn uh, 18, which is the, the critical age. Uh, 19 is the age of majority in BC, uh, but actually as of 18, uh, it becomes a critical um, age because that's when they become entitled to provincial assistance. And so uh, to be eligible for that provincial assistance, uh, you'll recall from our last session, there are financial tests. And if you were to uh, pass away and provide an inheritance to the child before they turn 18, and it's not sheltered um, in one of those uh, special discretionary trusts that we talked about last time, they would be ineligible uh, because they wouldn't meet the financial test. So you're weighing this kind of uh, risk of um, if, I don't set something up in my will now, and I don't have a trust for them, and I pass away before they turn 18, and it turns out at 18, they do need to have that eligibility, then we've got a problem, and we need to have to figure that out. But at the same time, if I go and spend the money to create this special trust, because it is a more costly thing to do, and it turns out at age 18 or 19, 
um, they don't need uh, that special trust because uh, their capacity is such that they don't qualify for the provincial assistance, so the eligibility doesn't matter, then have I spent some money that I didn't need to spend? Um, and so I can't give you a direct answer. All I can tell you is those are the two things that you have to weigh. Um, what is the likelihood uh, that the child who is a minor still uh, will end up uh, needing to have that assistance um, uh, from the trust? And is it worth spending the funds now uh, to set it up to make sure that it's there? I think a lot of parents would tell you it's good insurance to have um, if that becomes the case, um, but it's always an individual decision for each family to make. The next question is, uh, if a house is held in a discretionary trust or an inter vivos trust, uh, does it have a capital gains exemption? So just to, again, confirm what those are. So an inter vivos trust means a trust that's created during lifetime, as opposed to a trust that is created uh, through a will upon someone passing away. And discretionary trust just means that the trustee has the ability to decide um, uh, you know, what benefit uh, the trustee gets out of it. So the first point is the discretionary trust isn't really the factor um, that applies. Um, it is more about um, whether the trust uh, fits certain criteria. So the exemption that you're talking about is the principal residence exemption. So the idea is if we own a house through the trust and the uh, person uh, who, for whom the trust is the beneficiary uh, lives in that house as their residence, can the trust claim that residence as the principal residence? So it used to be that that wasn't uh, too difficult to do, but a few years back, the government changed the rules. Um, uh, at that time, they were concerned about foreign owned trusts. And so they got a big sledgehammer out um, and very much changed how the rules work for all trusts. And I think it had some unintended consequences. And so what they said is no trust will be able to claim the principal residence exemption unless it meets certain criteria. And the criteria that's relevant to us um, in this context is a qualified disability trust. So a qualified disability trust, that's a technical term, it's defined in the Income Tax Act. So that type of trust under the Income Tax Act can only be created upon death and has to have very restrictive terms um, that the person can be the sole beneficiary only during their lifetime um, uh, to get uh, some of those advantages. Um, and so that type of trust would be able to qualify for the principal residence um, if it's been carefully designed. And there were some complaints though, because obviously we use trusts during the person's lifetime as well. Um, and so all of a sudden it meant that we weren't gonna get the principal residence if we set up a trust to, you know, if a parent while they're alive uh, buys a property and holds it in trust uh, for their child to live in, all of a sudden that wasn't gonna get the principal residence anymore. And so um, they did not change the law to fix that, but what they did do is issue what they call a comfort letter from finance um, and from the Department of Finance, the federal government, saying that if you set up an inter vivos trust or a lifetime trust in that scenario, and you meet all the same criteria that the qualified disability trust does, uh, they would be prepared to treat that as well as a principal residence. So that's a very long answer. Um, um, and uh, what I would say is, if you are thinking of owning a property in a trust um, and it's a property that you'd like to have qualified for the principal residence exemption, you need to talk to someone who knows what these new rules are uh, to try to make sure that it applies because there is a real possibility that it wouldn't apply um, unless you've followed you know, the strict requirements of these new rules. Next question is if I, I know, I'm willing to make, pardon me, I'm willing to make my friend, my son's trustee, can my brother challenge it? Um, so, so I, I think um, the idea here is uh, I'm the parent um, and um, my son is uh, uh, going to need a trust uh, and I'm going to pick my friend. And the question is, can my brother challenge what I've done? Um, the answer to that, I, I think in most circumstances would be no, um, that uh, the brother wouldn't have any legal standing that I can think of uh, to be able to challenge that. Um, uh, in doing it. So you need to get more details in the specific uh, situation to answer that question fully. Uh, but it, uh, I, I would be surprised if the brother had any standing to do any challenging. Uh, next question. Can a trustee decide to collapse the trust 
if they feel the beneficiary is competent at some point after we pass? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so these discretionary trusts are usually designed um, so that the trustee at any point in time uh, can uh, pay it out if they feel that it's not required anymore. Um, there is some language that you want to have in the document to be able to make sure that the trustee is comfortable doing that. Um, the language is something to the effect of uh, the trust may be exhausted for the benefit of this beneficiary at any time, um, relieving the trustee from having to worry about, you know, trying to save something for remainder beneficiaries who might get something after the beneficiary passed away. Uh, next question, if my trustee is a lawyer, and in the event that my, my lawyer passes away, does that lawyer's business partner, another lawyer, automatically become my trustee? Um, so the answer to that is, is depends very much depends on what the will says. And so that's something that you would want to give instructions about. Um, so in my circumstance, there are some clients for whom I act as a trustee. Uh, we always find out what their preference is. Um, uh, quite often their default will be uh, that yes, um, you know, the uh, managing partner of my practice uh, would be able to uh, have um, a lawyer take over and manage the trust for them. Uh, but if clients have other preferences, we're happy to uh, account for that and adjust for it. So you do have to look at your specific will um, to find out what would happen. Next question. I have comity of person for an adult child. Can, I, can my will stipulate who resumes the responsibility upon my death? Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, a committee cannot appoint a successor committee. It always has to be done by the court. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't plan for that circumstance and kind of figure out what you would do. Um, so you can often line somebody up, uh, prepare them with all the information and materials that they would need to have. And even though you can't appoint them, you could put a statement in your will or other documents saying this is who I would prefer. A court will certainly pay attention to that but it does still have to go to the court to make an independent uh, decision. Uh, next question, can a disabled adult stepchild file a wills variation claim? So the current law in British Columbia is that the only people who can bring wills variation claims to challenge a will are a spouse or a legal child. So if a stepchild has not been adopted legally, um, then they would not typically be able to bring a claim. What are some questions we could ask prospective trust companies? Um, so there's a whole list of uh, questions that we um, provide to our clients when we're uh, having them go out and talk to prospective trustees, not just trust companies, but trustees in general. Um, some of those questions uh, would likely be, um, you know, how often are they dealing with uh, these types of trusts? How do they keep themselves informed about what the rules are? How would they deal with requests for certain types of assets? Um, what interactions do they have with caregivers? Um, and you know, how often would they be monitoring situations uh, that happen with your loved one? Those are some of the questions, but there's other ones along the way as well. Uh, what, and last question, uh, what happens if the trustee fails or the trust runs out of money? Um, well, if the trust runs out of money, it's just done. Um, that's the end of it. And all the money's gone out and the trust uh, just ends and collapses. Um, what happens if the trustee fails? I'm assuming what you mean by that is um, if it's a trust company and for some reason it goes out of business, or if there is a personal trustee and for some reason they're not able to continue anymore. Well, the first answer to that is it looks you look to the will. Uh, the will itself and the trust itself would say who is the next in line uh, to take over. Um, and uh, if it doesn't name a specific person, ours always also include a power for the a trustee to name someone or a different mechanism for that to be done. Uh, but if it all else fails, uh, then an application can be made to the court uh, by whoever would be appropriate uh, to take over, whether that's another professional um, or an individual uh, to be able to do that. So that took a little bit longer than I thought, uh, about 18 minutes, but um, I hopefully that gives you um, all the answers to those questions that we had last time. Um, if I haven't quite answered that question fully, feel free at the end of today's session uh, to also ask those questions. Um, but what I'm going to do now is just jump on from that discussion um, and uh, focus now on what our topic is for today. And so for today, what we're going to be talking about is um, uh, decision making. Um, and so how uh, decision making works. Um, and we're going to talk about it both for you and for your loved one. And so we're going to differentiate uh, between um, representation agreements and powers of attorney. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about 
uh, what the difference is between a section seven and a section nine power of attorney in particular. Uh, we're going to talk about what the uh, importance is of um, uh, being able to understand capacity to do these documents. And then we'll talk about private committeeship, uh, a court process, what's involved in that. Um, and we're going to talk about what you can do to avoid that. Because as you will learn, uh, the private committeeship is really tends to be a last case resort um, because it has some costs and complications that we typically try to avoid. So in the past session, the first session that we had, we focused on uh, wills and trusts, and that's critically important. Um, you know, what's going to happen to those inheritances and what you pass along to your loved ones. But that's not enough. That would be an incomplete plan if that's all we did. We also have to think about what happens while you're alive and also what happens while your loved one is alive and who's going to be able to make decisions. So in particular, for you, if you became incapable, but we're still alive, your will doesn't kick in yet. Um, we need something to give authority to someone else to be able to make decisions for you. And your decisions are going to be a little bit more complicated than typical because your family is not typical. Um, you do a lot, probably, to take care of your loved one. And we want to make sure that you've put plans in place that allow someone to continue to do that, to continue to use your financial resources um, and make the decisions you would want to make. Um, for taking care of your loved one. So that's you. Well, that's why we want to talk about these planning documents for you, but also for your loved one. We want to make sure that there's good supportive decision making for them. So while they're going through um, uh, the course of their lifetime, uh, there are certain decisions that might have to be made about uh, their um, a persons with disability entitlements, a uh, registered disability savings plan, um, you know, where they live, who they associate with, and so uh, quite often they may need some assistance with that. And we'll talk about how you can uh, provide some of that assistance. And so uh, personal planning is while well, you're alive. And we're going to talk about these documents, the representation agreement, power of attorney, advanced directive and others. And estate planning, of course, what we talked about in the first session was after death. Um, and that was wills and, and the trusts. So the first thing we always have to uh, talk about is the presumption of capacity and capability. So what that means is that uh, there is a presumption that as soon as a person becomes an adult in British Columbia, turns 19, they will have the full ability to make decisions for themselves. Um, now, that's not always the case for a number of different reasons. Um, and the other part about it is it's not capacity for everything. Capacity is a specific test to what it is that the person is trying to do. So for example, um, a person may well have capacity to take $5 to the store and get a chocolate bar and a drink, um, and, but they may not have the capacity to you know, make the long-term decision of spending $50,000 on a vehicle and how that fits into their budget and how that affects uh, their overall financial resources. Um, and so it is possible though, that there may be some people who aren't having the ability um, to make capacity for um, specific transactions ever, or that they have the capacity and due to something that has happened like an illness or a, an accident, um, that capacity has changed. Um, so there's many tools that we can use uh, for doing this. And basically the categories of decision-making are important. There are financial decisions and there are health decisions. And we're gonna talk about both of those today. So we'll start off first talking about financial decisions. So the primary tool um, that we use for making financial decisions is called an, a power of attorney. So again, as we mentioned, it's utilized while you're alive. It has no effect upon death. So you appoint a person to be your attorney. They make legal and financial decisions. Um, but there is a high test for being able to create a power of attorney to give someone that authority because it is a fairly risky idea. You're letting that person have control over your finances. One of the critical parts of that test is having an awareness of what your assets are, what their approximate value is, and what their comparative value is. So again, I describe it to clients as it's important that the person making the power of attorney appreciate that I may have you know, $500 in my bank account and that'll pay for you know, maybe a couple of meals and a movie, but that's different than having $500,000 in my bank account, um, which might help me with uh, a vehicle or, or getting some foothold into housing or things like that. And so appreciating that there is a difference between those things. Um, so the types of powers of attorney that we can use, there's a general power of attorney, 
um, meaning it covers all types of finances. There's specific powers of attorney. So you'll see this at banks. Uh, sometimes uh, when someone needs someone to help them deal with their bank account, the bank will offer up a document that they've created, but that's a very specific power of attorney. It's only going to work for that bank account. It won't work for other assets. What you will want to have, and most of our clients want to have, is an enduring power of attorney, which has broad powers like a general power of attorney. It can cover everything, but also the important part is that it endures. It continues to be effective, even if the person who made it um, loses their capacity uh, down the road. And that will allow that attorney then to continue to make decisions for them. And in fact, for most of our clients, that's really when it's intended to be used. So why do we want to do these? Well, it's super important if you own real estate, for example. So uh, if you own a house with your spouse and you are joint on the title and your spouse becomes incapable, you will not be able to deal with that house anymore. Um, you don't have the right to sign your spouse's name. Um, you have to have an enduring power of attorney to give you that right. If you don't have that document, then the only way that you can sell the house or refinance the house or deal with it is by going to court to get permission. And that's that private committee process we talked about that we're trying to avoid. So who do we appoint? So when we make this enduring power of attorney document, who do we pick? Well, often it's a spouse or children or friends or relatives or someone you have a close connection with. Um, but more and more, we're also seeing people pick professionals like a trust company or a professional person like a lawyer um, to be able to help manage things in a neutral and professional way. Um, there are fees that apply to this, whether it's for your family members or the trust company, um, and you get to decide what those fees should be. But it does have to be in the power of attorney document. Um, of course, also get expenses paid for in addition to whatever fee um, you might set aside for them. So what does an attorney have to do? Well, the Power of Attorney Act sets out very extensive requirements um, about acting in good faith um, and uh, being diligent and reasonably prudent, uh, but also keeping records. So as soon as you start managing someone else's affairs as an attorney, and again, I use the word attorney under the power of attorneys. So I'm not talking about lawyer when I say attorney. Attorney in this context means the person that's been appointed to make the decisions. Um, but you do have an obligation to now track everything. So you have to almost run this like a business. You have to keep track of every in and every out and keep the receipts for that because you can ask, be asked to account for it um, at a later date. You have to act in their best interests according to what you know their wishes and beliefs uh, to be able to be done. And you do have to give priority to taking care of them and their independence. Also, you have to keep the property separate um, unless it was already owned jointly. So for example, with your spouse, um, but otherwise you have to keep their money separate from your money. So the other area um, that we deal with is, um, oh, sorry, just, just before we do, I wanna point out one other thing. Um, one of the reasons in particular why you will want a power of attorney that's quite particular uh, and special to your circumstances is that the default rules, even under the power of attorney, is that it's very limited to only using your money for you. And a lot of our families in, in these circumstances do a lot of support for their loved one who has the disability. And so if you want that support to be able to continue, even though you've become incapable and somebody's making decisions for you about your money, you have to give them a special power in your power of attorney to be able to do that. And so it's really important um, to have not just a power of attorney, but a power of attorney that is designed for your circumstances where you may wanna continue um, that assistance and support. So the other area that we deal with for decision-making is healthcare decision-making, um, and that is uh, representation agreements. And so under representation agreements, um, the one that I'll talk about first is the section nine. Um, that's on the one side of the, the screen here on the left side. And so a section nine representation agreement is all about appointing someone to make health and personal care decisions for you. And it's very broad authority uh, to be able to make those uh, decisions that is granted. Um, you have to, again, like the power of attorney, meet certain tests uh, to be able to make uh, a section nine uh, representation agreement. Um, and the, the test is you have to be capable of fully understanding and appreciating the nature and consequences of making that document and the types of decisions that the person uh, might be able to make for you. So that's the healthcare side, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that works. 
Now, there is another type of representation agreement, though, that you really need to, to know about. And this is where we get into um, the types of documents that can be put in place to help you make decisions for your loved one. So the Section 9 representation agreement and the power attorney um, will definitely be things that you want to do for yourself for your decision making uh, to make sure that there's a, a good backup to you uh, to ensure that you, know, you're, you are taken care of and that your family is taken care of. Um, but then we move to the second part of uh, why we want to do these documents, and that is to support the decision making of our loved one um, who has the disability. And so if we can do a power of attorney and we can do a section nine full representation agreement, if our loved one has the abilities to do that, we should do those just like we would with anyone else. Uh, but if they don't have those full abilities, maybe they don't have the full appreciation of kind of the comparative value of $500 versus $500,000, then there is another thing that we can do. And this is the section seven representation agreement. Uh, and what it does is it allows us to create a document, uh, allows that person to create a document, even though they might not be able to meet the tests of a power of attorney and a full representation agreement or a typical representation agreement. If they can meet these other tests, they could still appoint someone to help them out. Uh, what happens is the types of things they can get people to do for them are a bit more limited. So it's limited to routine financial affairs um, and personal and health care. Um, there's other things that are more uh, risky or more extreme things that they're not able to do. For example, real estate, um, you can't do under a Section 7 representation agreement, but it does cover a broad range of most of the decisions that would need to be done. And the important part about it is you don't have to have that appreciation of the difference in value of money. Um, you don't even have to be able to do a contract um, or, or any of those things. Um, what you do need to do is be able to express that you have trust in someone, uh, that you want them to make decisions, and that you're able to distinguish between, you know, someone that you trust that you want to make decisions versus someone who you don't trust. Um, and so be able to kind of indicate a preference, both for decision making and who would be able to make those decisions. And if you can, then you can do this um, type of agreement that allows just like a power of attorney, some financial decisions, but not real estate. Um, and just like a full representation agreement, some healthcare, but maybe not all of those things. But often that's enough to take care of what the need is. It's a unique type of document. And it's interesting to note, it's only uh, BC that does that. So no other jurisdiction in Canada has this ability uh, to allow someone with a more limited capacity to still appoint someone to make decisions for them. In all the other provinces, you have to have the full higher level of capacities or else you don't get uh, that uh, autonomy uh, to be able to pick anyone. So it's a really great thing uh, that we have here in BC. So a little bit more about these section nine and section seven agreements. So I told you that there were some limitations on what you could do. So again, a section nine uh, representation agreement for healthcare is the broadest you can get. Um, it, it covers just about everything, life-saving treatment and, and other stuff. Um, and when you combine that with a power of attorney, which also covers all real estate and finances, you've covered off pretty much all the types of decisions that would need to be made. The section seven, as I mentioned, is more limited. So for financial affairs, it's things like paying bills and opening accounts. It does cover the RDSP, the Registered Disability Savings Plan, which is really important in our context. Uh, legal affairs for certain things and then certain health care and uh, personal care uh, decisions are covered by that agreement. Uh, but there are limitations. Um, so even the full Section 9 representation agreement can't be used for authorizing medical assistance in dying. Um, so uh, the right to ask a doctor to help you end your life uh, based on, on suffering and, and, um, uh, and a foreseeable end of life is a right that's unique to the individual. You can't authorize anyone else to make that decision for you. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, the representation agreement doesn't cover finances, that's the power of attorney. So on the representation agreement side, though, what are the limitations? So as I mentioned, it's not major financial decisions like buying real estate or dealing with a mortgage or doing things like that. It also does have some limitations on certain healthcare decisions. So life supporting care has limitations um, and a few other things um, that are on that list. So it's not without limitations, but it is still super helpful. So just like a power of attorney, a representative has limitations, 
that they have to follow when they're acting. And some of this will look similar to what you saw for the power of attorney on the earlier side. And that is they have to act honestly in good faith. They have to consult with the person, uh, even if they don't have capacity to find out what their wishes are, try to follow the wishes um, uh, as long as they're not uh, um, uh, being harmful, as long as it's reasonable to do that. And also comply with what you knew their wishes were before uh, when they may have had capacity if it's that situation. Um, if you don't know what the wishes are, uh, you follow what their best interests are and you keep, just like the power of attorney, you keep records um, of what's going on. Um, so a couple of things about the uh, power of attorney. So when it is getting made, uh, again, you do have uh, getting getting signed, you do have to have the adult sign it, you as the representative have to sign it. Um, and in particular, if there's a section seven representation agreement, and this is really important, um, the law does require there to be a monitor. So again, if this is the section seven representation agreement and you are not the spouse that's being appointed for the person, um, the law by default will, or, uh, will require a monitor uh, to be appointed. And so this is another person separate from the representative who has the power to oversee what's happening. Um, they don't get to make any decisions, um, but their responsibility is just to kind of monitor um, and uh, observe. And, and if they see something going wrong, uh, intervene and do something. So you do, if you're doing section set representation agreements, um, you do need to make sure you have a monitor because if there isn't one, technically the agreement won't uh, be valid. Um, the adult has to sign with two witnesses. Um, you can have just one witness if it's a lawyer or a notary. Um, and then the other, uh, the representative has to sign as well. There are certain people who can't be witnesses. And of course, if the adult um, is not able to physically sign, um, there are ways uh, that that can be done uh, to accommodate that, uh, that challenge for them. Um, you do have to be, I think I mentioned this, but you do have to be 19. So you can't do a representation agreement or a power of attorney um, for someone who's under 19. So what other things can we do for healthcare? Um, well, there is a document called an advanced directive where you can write out uh, what your preferences are for circumstances that come forward in terms of your care. And so you can uh, say, if this situation happens, I do or do not want um, this type of treatment. And then um, that gets set aside. Uh, if you go forward and it's a time when you're not able to make decisions about that, because if you can make decisions, you make them still, but if you're not able to, and that situation arises and the physicians can look at it and say, yep, checks all the box. So now we know what you want. Um, then that has a legal effect. It's you giving your advanced consent or refusal uh, for treatment. I would say to clients that it's used very rarely. And the reason for that is it's quite difficult to get it correct um, in terms of what those circumstances are. And also for most people, uh, they have someone in their life who they trust and who knows them and would rather have them make that decision than try to have a physician interpret what this document says. But in some cases, that's not the situation. You may not have someone that you feel comfortable taking on that responsibility for you. Uh, an advanced directive would be good for that situation. Or it could be that the people in your life who you do like uh, and are close to just wouldn't want the burden of doing that, or you know it would be hard for them to do, or they wouldn't want to do what you want that would be a reason to do an advanced directive. Uh, organ donation is also able to be uh, given in terms of consent. Uh, and then as I mentioned, medical assistance in dying, uh, which it has criteria for um, and which has to be done by the person. It's not possible for a representative or anyone else to make that decision for someone else. It has to be the person uh, themselves. So what happens if we go through uh, a situation where we haven't been able to put the plans in place or um, the, uh, uh, the person simply never had the capacity to do any of those things, a power of attorney, a representation agreement, or even a section seven representation agreement. Well, um, again, we've got two areas of healthcare decision-making. We've got, uh, sorry, two areas of decision-making, healthcare and financial. So on the healthcare side, uh, what we can do is um, there is a default. So the act contains uh, a, what's called a temporary substitute decision maker, and we'll see a bit more information about that. Um, but it means that someone who is a next of kin, you know, it starts at spouse, uh, then adult child, then parent, and then siblings. So there's a hierarchy of who would by default be able to make decisions for healthcare purposes 
if the adult can't do it for themselves. So there is a kind of a default backup plan there. But as I mentioned before, when it comes to the finances, there is no backup. Um, so the only way to get the power to be able to make financial decisions for someone who is over 19 and is not able to make those decisions for themselves and not able to appoint someone is to go to court. And that court process is called a uh, committeeship or appointing a committee. Uh, so it is a court appointed decision maker. Um, it deals with finances and legal. It can also deal with um, personal and health care as well. So there's two parts um, of the property. Of the property is the financial and legal. Uh, committee of the person is the health care and personal care uh, decisions. So it's the Patients Property Act that governs it. And the challenge is that this is a very old act. We are one of the only provinces that has not updated um, this particular area of law. We've done lots of good things, as I mentioned to you, uh, you know, with representation agreements. But when it comes to getting the courts involved, we're still stuck under a very old, um, archaic uh, system. The public guardian and trustee is another option. So it doesn't have to be an individual. Um, if there is a person who needs assistance uh, and the PGT determines that it's appropriate for them to intervene, they can do it themselves. Remember the public guardian trustee is a government, quasi government office um, that has the responsibility of looking after vulnerable adults uh, and children in BC. But again, these are always last resorts. So let's explore a little bit about comiteeship. So who can be a committee? Well, the private committee. So usually it's a family member or a friend, but it could also be a trust company. So if you feel that it's not appropriate for you to get involved and you'd rather have a professional do it, you can have a trust company apply to do that, but it is expensive. So the costs start at about seven and a half thousand dollars and depending on the complexity can get much higher. Um, as I mentioned, if there's not anyone that's willing to act privately, it is also possible to have the government uh, office or quasi government office, the public guardian and trustee apply, but that's a decision that they make only if they think these circumstances are appropriate. So what all do we have to do when we're going to court uh, to get this decision? Made? Well, we need two medical affidavits. So we have to have two different physicians um, attend and examine uh, the adult for whom uh, we're going to have the court order made, and they have to give their opinion, um, whether they're capable or not of managing the affairs. And there is a charge for that. Um, it is not unusual for that to be, you know, $300, $2,000. Uh, so it's important to establish in advance, you know, what you think those costs will be. Um, Affidavit of kindred and fortune. This is another affidavit that the person making the application has to put in and you have to give all kinds of information. So you have to talk about the family, the living arrangements, what their income and expenses are, what their assets and liabilities are, uh, and why they feel that they are appropriate uh, to be able to make uh, decisions. The uh, PGT will sometimes ask for a care plan so that uh, it's clear what uh, the uh, guard, what the committee is going to do. Uh, the PGT, the government guardian trustee, reviews these. So there is mandatory um, that uh, all this information has to be, before it goes to the courts, has to go to the public guardian trustee so that they can review it and give comments, which the court will consider when it makes the decision. And of course, there's a charge for that, uh, $525. Um, so certain people have to be notified. So other family members typically will also need to know uh, that you're applying. If there was anybody acting as uh, a, a power of attorney or a representation agreement, uh, they will need to be notified as well. And it is not unusual for it to be three or four months uh, for that to happen because of all these evidence and procedures you have to line up. So once the person is appointed, it's still uh, a little bit cumbersome. Um, the act does not really give a lot of good direction about what the uh, committee, the person who's been appointed to make the decisions should do. It simply says they have all the rights and powers and that they should try to take care of the family and they should try to promote independence. Um, but the court itself has the ability to put restrictions on and often will um, uh, based on the comments from the public guardian and trustee. Um, the default uh, when the public guardian trustee makes its comments is to say, well, will allow the committee to access the income, but we won't allow the committee to access any of the capital assets unless they check with us first. Um, and so it very much changes the flexibility that you have as a family to manage the person's assets when you're having to go back and get permission all the time uh, to uh, deal with these. So what is the effect of the committee ship if there were planning documents? Um, so any of those will uh, likely uh, get uh, terminated. So the power of attorney for sure um, uh, does. 
And uh, the representation agreement doesn't have to be, but often is. Um, and so this is kind of a trump that uh, takes over any of the prior arrangements. Um, so those are all go away and the committee ship happens. You might ask, well, why, why would anyone go and get a court committee order if there were these documents? Um, sometimes those documents aren't effective for some reason, but also sometimes there's a dispute. Uh, maybe the person that's been acting as the power of attorney or the representation agreement hasn't been doing a great job and the court determines that someone else uh, should take over and do that. So good things about the committee ship, it does give the best form of protection. So if there are concerns about the safety and financial security of the adult, if they're vulnerable to people taking advantage of them, um, then having the committee ship is helpful because it allows you to take the position that anything that anyone does with that adult is presumed to have taken advantage of them. So if they try to get them into, into a contract or try to make them do a gift or buy them something, um, you're able to use the law to say, no, um, you've taken advantage of the person. And then the onus is on you know, the person who received it to prove how they didn't take advantage. So it does give you some protection. The other part is if you're relying upon a representation agreement um, or a power of attorney, those could always be canceled. So if the person uh, who uh, is vulnerable uh, gets under someone's influence, that person could convince them to cancel those documents and then you have no authority. Uh, the committee ship can't be canceled without uh, going back to court. So it also um, it does have the benefit of the oversight of the public guardian trustee. It's not always a bad thing to make sure that there's somebody kind of watching to make sure that things are well taken care of, um, but it can be cumbersome, which is the con side. Um, so uh, the adult does not have uh, as much of their autonomy anymore because of these presumptions um, against them being able to do things for themselves. Um, it just means people won't treat them as if they can do things for themselves. As I mentioned, it's costly. It takes a lot of time. This is all private, not, not private. This is public documents uh, that go out and it's hard to undo if uh, there's a change required later. Um, the other part is, as I mentioned, um, you know, the oversight of the public guardian trustee can be a good thing to make sure that the right things are done, but it can be very cumbersome. Um, and they really do a one size fits all. Um, I, I tell clients uh, because they just, it's very frustrating for them, all these checks and balances that they have to have from the PGT. The PGT approaches this and has to because law requires them to. They have to approach it from the perspective that everyone, including you, is trying to take advantage of this person. And it's their job to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so they will put all kinds of restrictions that from a family context don't really seem to be reasonable. But from their perspective, in terms of protecting that vulnerable person, um, you know, that's why they do it. So is the committee ship necessary? Well, there is a, a test for when the public guardian and trustee uh, gets involved. Um, and so these are the things that they look at. So is the adult needing someone to make decisions? Are they incapable of making the decisions for themselves? Would they benefit from it? Um, and uh, are, are the needs of the adult not met by other means? and that they haven't appointed anyone else to do these things. And so there are some situations where the assets are very modest, uh, the decisions are very uh, routine, um, and matters seem to be in place where the PGT may say, well, it's not worth us going in and disrupting this person's life, uh, even though uh, they might not have formal decision-making in place. Um, and so what are some of the things you could look at as alternatives to having to go to either the public guardian or trustee to make decisions or a full private committee ship? Well, you typically don't need the formal court authority or a power of attorney or a representation agreement for dealing with things like the PWD payments, uh, federal pensions such as CPP or GIS, guaranteed income supplement or old age security. Um, there are informal methods that can be set up to deal with those as is the same with CLBC funding. And then healthcare decisions, as I said, remember for healthcare decisions, there's a default. So it goes to next of kin. So that default system might take care of those healthcare decisions. So if you can kind of get by with all of these uh, kind of informal methods, um, that's a great thing to do. One of the things though, that is more and more common is a good thing, but it does mean uh, that there's a bit more decision-making formality required. And that is the registered disability savings plan. There's nothing on here um, that says that, you know, an informal process for the RDSP will necessarily continue to work. Well, our, our children are minors. There is a system that allows that to happen. That can sometimes continue on just kind of in an informal basis afterwards. But technically, 
it's not wrong for a bank to take a position that if the adult who has the RDSP is not capable of making decisions about it, um, you know, the bank can say, we need someone who has a formal legal authority to be able to deal with those. While the RDSPs were small and growing over their initial start, that wasn't as much of a concern. But now it's not unusual to have RDSPs well over 100, some even $200,000. Um, and my concern is the banks will start to get a bit more nervous about that and may come back and require some formal authority. So considering trying to get um, a Section 7 representation agreement in place uh, to head that off is a really good idea. And if it's not, being prepared that you might have to do a comiteeship uh, to deal with it is the other option. So again, I mentioned uh, about how healthcare works. So just to reconfirm as to what uh, planning is in place. If you can make decisions, you make those decisions. If you are not able to make those decisions, um, then it is the committee. So the court appointed person is who would make those decisions. Um, then if uh, after that, it would be the representation, a representative. So under a section nine or a section seven representative agreement, uh, an advanced directive could also apply. So remember that's the document in which you set out your preferences. And then finally, if none of those are in place, we do still have the default, which is the temporary substitute decision maker. And as I mentioned, it's spouse, adult child, parent, sibling, grandparent. That's kind of the extension. The hierarchy keeps going after that as well. Um, but it's not just anybody that fits those criteria. So you have to be an adult yourself. You have to have had contract within the last 12 months and have not have had disputes. So, you know, if they're, if, if siblings are on the outs with each other, it wouldn't be appropriate for that sibling to make those healthcare decisions. Um, it's not personal care decisions um, or emergency, it's just um, uh, health uh, decisions. And again, there are limitations when it comes to their authority for life uh, support treatment. And that's why if you can do a representation agreement, um, it's usually uh, better because it, it doesn't have those same restrictions. So how do we avoid having to get into the committee ship or um, the default system? And, you know, what are the benefits of planning? Well, if it's possible, as I mentioned, create the Section 9 representation agreement and the enduring power of attorney. Um, if you have the capacity to do that, that is absolutely what you should be doing. If your loved one who has the disability has the capacity to do those things, again, that is what they should be doing. Those are the best tools for dealing with decision making during a person's lifetime. However, if there is a question about the capacity and they may not be able to do uh, the typical versions of those documents, we still do in British Columbia have this section seven representation agreement that's available and it can really help. Um, it helps with uh, legal decisions for health and financial. You can uh, have specific decisions that you want. So your loved one can be really clear about that, but you know that the representative has to follow what their wishes and beliefs are. You avoid this whole statutory default scheme. You avoid the costs and the delays and the intrusiveness of the committeeship. And you have someone um, to give authority to make decisions um, uh, for doing it uh, in, in terms of doing that. And so you get, you get the autonomy of choosing who makes uh, the decisions for you. So uh, finally, just to kind of bring it all together, this is just a quick chart. Hi. So this quick chart will just give you an idea of how all of these different tools uh, fit. Sorry, I'm on, I'm on a conference. Sorry, I don't know what to say. So these, this chart just gives a, a, a quick uh, uh, overview of what we've talked about today. So what are the different tools that we use for financial, legal, or health, or personal care decision making? So an enduring power of attorney um, covers financial and legal, does not cover health care or personal care, um, but is very broad, covers all financial and legal. Uh, the Section 9 representation agreement, conversely, is the partner to that. Um, it does cover health care and personal care, doesn't cover um, financial or legal, but is very broad in what it covers. So those two are the companion documents that we would say is you know, the ultimate gold standard for making sure that your decision making is well taken care of. Um, however, if uh, the person is not able to meet the uh, cognitive tests to create those typical documents, we do still have the Section 7 representation agreement available to us, and it covers all of those things. So financial, legal, health, and personal care. It's just that there are limitations, and those limitations are routine things. Um, uh, the most obvious example is you can't deal with real estate. 
with a Section 7 representation group. Some of the other options are the advanced directive. So you can, in advance, say what you want to happen for specific medical treatment, either to have it or not to have it. Uh, just remember, it's a little bit tricky to try to get that right. And my view is you're probably better off uh, with appointing someone who you trust to help with those decision makings. In default of all of those things, um, we do have the temporary substitute decision maker for healthcare. So if uh, the person is not able to make either the full documents, the typical documents, or the Section 7 representation agreement, um, we do still by default have the ability for a next of kin to make healthcare decisions for them, which can be very helpful. And remember, we also do have some of those informal things. Um, so when it comes to PWD or federal pensions, um, there are informal ways of managing those if those are the only assets. But if we reach a situation where decisions must be made um, about finances uh, or real estate or the default systems aren't working, then the option that we have left is the comiteeship. That could be the statutory one through the public guardian and trustee. You just turn all the decision making over to that office to do it. But uh, more often, families would prefer to do a private committeeship where they're the ones appointed by the court uh, to be able to make these decisions. But remember, and it is unfortunately still a very costly process, uh, time consuming, um, and it does to some degree take away the autonomy of the person for whom the committee court order has been made. But it is there and it is a tool and we do use it and we do our best to try to manage through it. Um, and sometimes it is the best solution um, in a difficult situation. So there are other resources that uh, you can go to uh, to find out more information. Um, so I'm uh, making this presentation uh, today um, on behalf of uh, Ken Kramer. Um, KMK uh, is uh, his uh, law firm and he's got a lot of good information there on that website. Um, NIDIS uh, is another website you can look to for personal planning information. So they have a lot of helpful information about uh, powers of attorney and representation agreements. And then the PGT itself um, uh, does have information about comiteeship. Um, and in particular, there's a handbook um, that you can take a look at. Um, and that'll let you know a little bit more um, about uh, how the comiteeship process works. And then, of course, um, you are always welcome to uh, get a hold of me. Um, this is uh, my phone number and uh, my uh, specific email address, and I'd be uh, happy to you know, talk to you about any individual situations that you have, because of course, everything we've talked about today is general information. Um, and um, uh, so hopefully that'll give you more uh, things to think about, but I know for a fact that it often leads to more questions than it does answers. Um, and the best way to answer those questions is to talk to you specifically about what your family uh, needs might be and how some of these tools uh, might fit in uh, to be able to, uh, to do that for you. So I'm going to uh, pause there um, and maybe Stella turn it back over to you um, because I think we might have some questions. Yes, we uh, do have questions. Can you hear me well? I'm putting I, on my headphone now. Okay. I can, so, yeah. Yeah, so um, there are more than 10 questions there. Uh, the first question is actually from uh, our last presentation. So Bill asks, a discretionary trust is set up and managed by professional. And if the beneficiary passed away, does the trust go to the surviving sibling? So uh, that's, that's a good question. So it depends on what you set up when you set up the trust. So I, I'm assuming that this is a parent setting up a discretionary trust for their child. Um, they will, at the time it's set up, as the lawyer, I will ask them specifically, um, what do you want to happen uh, when, um, when the main beneficiary passes away? And they will set out for me a hierarchy of here's to whom it should go. And so we often think, you know, if, if it's uh, uh, possible that um, the, the beneficiary could have descendants of their own, that's probably where we start. Um, and then we put in backups about uh, usually it's their siblings, so the other children, um, and then sometimes it goes further than that. Um, sometimes it even includes charity, uh, but it is really important to think about when I create this type of discretionary trust, not just what's happening you know, during the person's lifetime, but also what's supposed to happen at the end of the day to make sure that that's been taken care of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, Bethan asks, who decides if someone is mentally capable or not? 
and what needs to be done to figure that out. Um, shall we do that before the person turn 19 or 18? Right. So, so the answer to that question is ultimately um, it would be a court uh, on a legal basis that would decide if a person is mentally capable. However, um, the practical answer to that is anybody who is dealing with that person um, and having that person make decisions has to, for themselves, determine does the person have the capacity to do what it is that they're doing or what it is that I'm asking them to do. So as an example, um, if the person is in the hospital and a physician is proposing or a nurse is proposing a certain type of treatment, um, they have to ask themselves, does this person appreciate the nature and the consequences of what I'm asking them to decide? Um, and if they determine that the person does, great. On they go and they'll make that decision. Hopefully they get it right um, in terms of the person's capacity. Um, if they decide that the person doesn't have the capacity, then they go to, okay, well, who would have the capacity? And that's that hierarchy um, that I described for you in the earlier slide. Um, in the same way, as a parent, um, you know, I think you have to think, well, if I pass away and I leave my inheritance to my child, are they mentally capable of being able to manage that? And should I have a trust in place uh, to be able to do that for them? Um, another example of mentally capable would be, so they've turned 19 and we're going to do a section seven representation agreement. Well, anybody that's being a witness on that or helping them make it as a lawyer or a notary would have to, for themselves, decide that the adult is mentally capable of the tests for making a Section 7 representation agreement. So there's, that's a long answer to say there's a lot of different circumstances. You have to ask that question in each one of those uh, circumstances. Can I interrupt? Please? Yes. Um, I just actually dealt with this question. My son's 14 and in the school system, when you are in a school, you have to do a psychoeducational assessment, which I just did. Um, and then you, uh, based on that assessment, is where they determine if you get um, community living assistance from British Columbia. Um, so you have to get it all done prior to 18. Usually it needs to be done no later than 15 or 16. So if that helps someone who's under 18, that's usually what we have to get to get the ball rolling in terms right. of that. Yeah, so that's, so that's, a, that's, a, that's an entirely, yet again, another purpose for um, uh, doing uh, the testing of mental capacity in terms of eligibility for funding. So now what we're talking about is uh, not so much, you know, what that person's ability is to make decisions and how do we support them in that process, but, um, you know, what is the nature of their particular abilities or disabilities and does that qualify them for assistance? And I agree 100% um, that um, there is a time frame to getting these things done and you don't want to wait um, in that process because um, you know for example that you, you've described one uh, CLBC program uh, there's also the uh, uh, persons with disability program from the province and uh, yes you can apply as soon as they turn 18 but you want to have a lot of those ducks lined up in a row before then um, to be ready to do that and then the other part is you know if you've got someone who for example um, received an inheritance from a grandparent and is sitting on, you know, $100,000 of, uh, of inheritance that when they turn 19 will get turned 100% over to them. Um, you may want to think about um, what decision making tools do we need to put in place uh, before they turn 19. So um, the ages 18, 19 in British Columbia are particularly important. And I would agree with you that, you know, starting as early as 14, um, uh, to think about it and start planning things is a really good idea. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and I will suggest that the audience just mute themselves. If you have any question, you can just type in the chat. So that will be easier for us to manage, okay? Um, so just a follow-up question about the session seven uh, of the representation agreement. Um, so that agreement will, will be set up after they turn 19, right? Not not before. That's right, yeah. They have to be yeah. 19 to be able to make that agreement. Okay, so do they have to go through any testing before like to um, to, to, uh, to show that they're mentally not capable of making decisions? 
So, so the responsibility for that really lies on whoever is assisting them in creating the document and really witnesses. Um, so the witnesses by signing and saying, yes, I'm witnessing this adult signature are effectively saying, yeah, I believe that this person, you know, meets the tests uh, for being able to, to do that. So, um, you know, there's no formal process that a person has to go and do such as with CLBC. Um, it's just uh, the people that are involved in creating it have to satisfy themselves um, that, uh, yeah, the person has the ability to do that. So, so what would happen if someone who clearly didn't have the Section 7 ability um, ended up having a, an RDSP made for them? Um, it's possible that someone down the road who's asked to rely on that Section 7 agreement may refuse because they may say, well, I'm not satisfied uh, that the person really you know, was able to make that. And I don't know, I don't think it's valid. So uh, it is important to turn your mind to that when you make the agreement. Um, a lawyer or a notary can obviously help you with that. Um, but a lot of these ones are also done, um, you know, just by parents uh, individually using NIDAS uh, as an example. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, Alex has an experience with the bank that the bank did not accept the power of attorney even though the representative well, was granted all the powers without limitation. So what, what can they do? Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I, I, don't, I haven't seen a bank necessarily not accept a power of attorney, um, but I think, you know, again, in that example, if a bank you know, knew the adult, knew what their capabilities was, um, and then saw that a power of attorney had been made at a time when they felt the adult didn't have the capacity to do it, um, you know, I could see a bank um, refusing to act. Um, similarly, with a representation agreement, Section 7, if, if the bank was in a similar circumstance, I think they could say, well, we, we are concerned that that document is not valid. Um, and uh, so, uh, so and, and the problem is um, with a bank, if you're just bringing a new account there, they can choose who they do business with. Where it becomes more difficult is if there's an account already there and now they're refusing um, to use uh, or recognize the document that you think uh, should be used, um, that this gets a bit more difficult because really if their refusal stands, your only other option is going to be able to go to court and get a committeeship. And so one of the things we've looked at is sometimes bringing a court application just to confirm the validity of the uh, power of attorney and the representation agreement. Um, and sometimes when we've done that, we've put the bank on notice um, that, uh, you know, that they're causing extra costs uh, for having us do that. Um, one of the things I have seen is uh, some banks are being more reluctant to deal with Section 7 representation agreements um, and not because of the circumstances I've described, which to me are, are understandable, but simply because they don't want to deal with them. Um, and I'm very concerned about that. Um, I think that that is... Um, frankly, a violation of the human rights of someone who has a disability, who has a legal right to make this agreement and a legal right to expect it to be enforced. Um, and so what we're asking people to do is if you run into these situations where a bank or other institution is refusing to acknowledge what appears to be a valid Section 7 agreement, um, I'd say first, you know, escalate it at the bank and, and, you know, make sure that they really understand what's going on because there's a lot of new folks out there that may not really understand. Uh, but if the bank is legitimately taking the position that no, they're just not going to deal with Section 7 representation agreements, please let me know or contact the Disability Alliance of BC uh, to let them know uh, because I, I think we do need to do some advocacy in our community uh, to make sure that these agreements work for people. Thank you so much, Jeff. I think uh, that has been a problem, right? So um, a follow-up question is from Denise. Does Section 7 uh, representation agreement allow financial decisions like opening bank accounts, TFSA, RSP, life insurance? So I guess like, um, um, and, and also for RDSP, because this question um, about RDSP is when a person reached the age of 18 years old, the, the RDSP has to be under their, their, their name. So if there's an uh, RA7, then the parent can also um, help to manage the R RDSP. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely, yes. And, um, and, and I would, to answer Deesa's question, uh, again, I would say yes. The only, the only one I'm not 
as sure about is the life insurance. I'd have to go and check. There's a whole list, Denise, in the regulations um, uh, that uh, I think there's like 20 or 30 different things that they list that you can do or can't do. Um, and off the top of my head, I just don't remember whether life insurance, uh, where it fits on that list, um, but it probably is in there somewhere. Uh, but bank accounts, RDSP, all those things, yeah, no problem. Okay, so uh, the next question is from Bethan. She asks, um, does RA7 allow parents to make decision on behalf of a disabled person uh, for psychiatric hospitalization? Yeah, that's so Bethan, that's, that's actually a, a remarkably complex uh, question um, uh, in BC. So uh, in British Columbia, um, we have the Mental Health Act, and the Mental Health Act allows for involuntary admissions. So that means that if um, a director of a health, a mental health facility um, believes that a person is a substantial risk to uh, harm of themselves or others, they can commit them, that's the old words, um, uh, to involuntarily have to be at the facility. Um, if that happens, then the law itself uh, which is somewhat archaic, takes the right away from both the person and any of their representatives when it comes to psychiatric treatment. Um, the law says that the physicians, the psychiatrists, are automatically deemed to be able to give consent to psychiatric treatment to a person who's been involuntarily committed. Now, that only applies to psychiatric treatment. It doesn't apply to any other form of healthcare treatment. So your Section 7 would still apply to those other forms of healthcare treatment, um, but the Mental Health Act does allow currently that override. I can tell you that there has been a constitutional challenge to that, um, to say that that's a violation of the uh, patient's uh, and the adult's rights, um, but that's still in progress. Um, there is a, a, um, a not-for-profit group, I believe their name is Health Justice, um, and um, they are kind of tracking what's going on with that uh, challenge um, that you could take a look at just to see, um, you know, what the process is. The, the province itself has committed to doing something about that, um, but, you know, they've been saying that for well over a decade, um, and that still is the condition. Okay, thank you. The next question was asked by Denise. So Denise wanted to know, can someone with a physical disability get a signature stamp made and use it for signing legal documents? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think that that would probably be okay. Um, there are a whole bunch of, like every time you do your signature, it always depends on the context in which you're doing it. Um, but uh, clearly for the documents we've talked about, it does say that the person just has to make a mark or an indication. So an X would be fine. I don't see why a stamp wouldn't be fine. Um, and in fact, you can go one step further in that um, you can, if you don't have a stamp available and you can't make the X, you can direct someone to do it for you. Um, so I think that would probably work in the circumstances we've talked about. Um, I can't speak for every legal circumstance, um, but uh, I think in most cases um, uh, that we've talked about, it should work. Okay, thank you. So uh, Phil asked, does session nine uh, of the representation agreement equal committee ship? Uh, good question. So it, it doesn't uh, because uh, first uh, section nine only deals with health and personal care, uh, whereas committee ship, if it's both of the person and the property, it covers everything. Um, and there are some some different contexts uh, as well to that, um, but um, uh, so so that's that that would be the main difference uh, between the uh, two of them. Mm -hmm. um, Charmaine asked a question related to um, part one of this talk. So she said that um, they have a will that leaves her sister and her, uh, her sister's husband as guardian of uh, their child. So everything will go to them, including money and house to use to raise their son. And they have put in the will that uh, the sister not sell the house unless needed. And if she does, she will use the money to raise their son. And the sister also has a similar will for them and her daughter. Is this uh, sufficient? So, so if, if I understand it correctly, the idea is that the sister and husband are named as the guardians and the will gives 
everything to them personally um, on the expectation that they will you know, use that money and make decisions about it to raise, uh, raise their son um, and, and is not using a trust. So what I would have to say is that that probably won't work uh, because what will happen is upon your uh, deaths, um, the public guardian and trustee will have to get notice uh, that you've passed away and that everything is legally going to your sister and her husband, not legally bidding set aside for your child. And so the public guardian and trustee would probably challenge that will on the basis that it doesn't trust your sister and her husband to use the money for your son because it's legally controlled by them and there's nothing legally obligating them to do that. So they would challenge it and they would say it needs to be changed to set that money aside for your son um, in a more legal fashion. Um, and so to avoid that, what we do is we use the discretionary trust or the Henson Trust. So what we would say is everything is set aside and your sister and her husband can be the trustees and be in control of it. But the trust is very clear that it's not meant to be used for them. It's only meant to be used for your son. Um, and, and then that should satisfy the public guardian trustee to prevent it from, uh, from being challenged. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So the next question by Denise is, are session seven recognized by the federal government? Yes, yes, they are. That's great. And Anne asked, um, this is a question from last from the last talk. Uh, she's interested in rolling her son's RESP into our DSP, and she's wondering uh, how that will work and who she should talk to. Yeah, it's a good question, and it's and it's a recent thing that's just been introduced uh, in the last few years uh, that does permit that. But there are some very specific criteria that have to be met before you can do the rollover, and it does have a bit of an effect on the RDSP um, and the grants and bonds. Um, and so, what I would suggest is you probably want to talk to um, uh, an accountant who works in this area. Um, uh, to make sure that you're following all of the proper requirements uh, to do it. So effectively with the RESP, you have to, in layman's terms, demonstrate that there's really no prospect of it still being used for education purposes and that therefore it's appropriate to move it over to the RDSP. And there's some age and other criteria that are related to that. Um, and so I would say, um, I, I think that's probably available information through the federal government, uh, but I wouldn't want you to rely just on the website. I would recommend if, if there's enough involved, it's probably worth um, you know, having someone take a look at it specifically and, and walk you through that process for the rollover. Thank you. So uh, John asked, would you have a checklist of the information that we should have in place prior to a meeting with a lawyer? Yeah, so, so a couple of things that you would look at is, um, uh, so on the kmklaw.net website, um, there is a questionnaire uh, that you can fill out, um, and it just gives you the opportunity to provide information about you, your family, your assets, um, and that would just really help make the meeting go much faster. Um, I always encourage my clients to do that so that when I meet with them, we don't have to spend all of our time doing that we can just jump right into making sure that I understand what you've put in there um, and then right into decision-making about, you know, what's the best planning for your family. So it's great to be able to do that uh, checklist or questionnaire. And I think you'll find it on that website. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, and asks, is a session seven agreement limited in time as well? Does it get reviewed to see if it's still appropriate? No, once it's been made, um, it's effective unless something happens to cancel it. So uh, what would cancel it if the person died or if the uh, person who was named uh, became incapable uh, themselves? Uh, but once it's been made, if it's been properly made, it continues to be effective. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, I have a follow-up question. So if the Session seven uh, representation agreement has been made and changes need to be made. Like for example, uh, the five people, like one of them is not doing it anymore. Can we make changes easily? Um, you can, it's almost always easier just to make a new one. Okay. Um, 
is, okay. is my experience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Patricia asks, is committeeship valid nationally? Ooh, good question. Um, yes and no. So it is done provincially. Uh, most provinces will recognize um, each other's uh, court orders, uh, but sometimes that does require a little extra effort in those places. Um, but uh, in, in most cases, you know, we've been okay in terms of that. You have to look at each province to see how they would recognize another province's um, uh, appointment. Okay. So uh, the following question is about cost. I guess last time you talked about the cost to set up a wheel with additional uh, pay per work for trust. So uh, perhaps you can um, talk about that a little bit again, because there are sure. two questions. Can you give us a sense of some of the costs and how much does it cost to set up a wheel and additional paperwork for a disabled child or adult? Right. So, um, so I'll just start uh, on the, the will, just to recap what we talked about before. So I'll tell you, these are our charges, uh, which I think are fairly consistent, but um, you'd have to check with each person that you're working with. So uh, a basic will is usually about $800. Um, but uh, if we're doing it for a couple, we can uh, do the second will for about $400. Um, but those are only basics. Those would not include the trusts. Um, as you've seen, you know, cometeeship or uh, doing an inter vivos trust is easily $7,500 or more. Uh, but when we do it in your will, we can save a little bit of money to create that trust. And so usually it adds about $2,500 to the will. That's because we just have to draft it. We don't have to actually fund it or set it up until you've passed away. So that's on the wills. Um, on the powers of attorney that we've talked about today and the representation agreements, uh, the first document is usually about $600 and the second document is usually about $200. Um, so all of that also depends on um, you know, not having any other complications. Um, you know, some of those complications could be if you are a blended family, so it's a second relationship and you've got kids from uh, different relationships that could complicate things a little bit. Um, and it's important to get good and proper advice about that. Uh, the other would be if you have any US connections. So if you or your child is a US citizen or has ever um, lived or worked in the US, uh, that's an example of where that could get a bit more complicated as well. But those are kind of typical. Uh, the cometeeship is you know, easily $7,500 um, on a basic one, uh, but it can certainly be more because of the medical and PGT costs are on top of that. So the 7,500 is just the legal costs. Wow, that's very expensive. It is. So um, I have a follow-up question for the representation agreement. The section seven and section nine is the same cost, right? About 200. Um, so section seven and section nine. So yeah, so a representation agreement is usually about $600. And then the second one would be $200. Um, so again, a section seven representation agreement, we, you know, would probably be in that range. Um, the challenge, though, is sometimes determining a person's capacity to make a Section 7 is a bit more complex. Um, it's not always obvious that they satisfy that criteria. And so it is possible that a bit more work might need to be done in that area. Um, but I would say, um, you know, more of them than, than not don't require that, um, but some do. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Oh, just a moment. Okay, so this one is about assessment for mental capacity. So uh, Melanie want to ask what are the diagnosis categories? Yeah, so, so there really aren't uh, diagnosis categories. Um, so for assessing mental capacity, it's more about function. Um, so it is, um, is the person able to appreciate the nature and consequences of what it is that they're trying to do? Um, and so when it comes to cometeeship, for example, um, there's no categories. It's just, is the person based on whatever their individual circumstances are, which could be informed by the categories, um, are they capable of managing their own affairs and are they capable of making decisions about their finances? So what we always do is we take the medical um, and functional um, assessment and translate that into 
um, you know, what are they able to do in terms of the transactions um, that are required. So definitely it, it requires an awareness of, of um, you know, of autism or Down syndrome or any of these uh, illnesses that might affect cognitive abilities, uh, just as it was, does require some, you know, understanding of, of the various dementias of Alzheimer's or Lewy body or frontal lobal. Um, uh, but we rely on the medical folks to kind of translate that to us in terms of how does this affect the person's ability to manage their affairs and do certain daily living activities. Uh, and then we provide that to the court to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, the next one you already answered, maybe I still asked it. So for does session seven allow for reassessment over time? In other words, can the person ask to have the agreement changed to a session nine if his skills improve? So, so any section seven or section nine is always subject to the person, right? So as long as they've got capacity to change their mind about something, they can change anything that they want. Um, and so that would absolutely include the ability for someone to say, hey, um, you know, I think my capacity would allow me to do um, a section nine or a, um, um, a, a power of attorney. And if they can, great, uh, because that just gives a little bit more uh, flexibility about managing their affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, can a person have two qualified disability trust example with divorced parents? Yes, this is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, you would think that you should be able to, but the current drafting on the legislation does not allow that. And so then the secondary question is, can you have one qualified disability trust to which the other parent transfers into um, after um, they pass? And I'm not even 100% sure that you can do that. We have some informal confirmations that you might be able to do that. Uh, but as you can imagine, among divorced parents, uh, getting to that level of coordination could be a bit of a challenge. Um, so right now, we do have to be very careful uh, in the situation of separated parents um, as to who's going to set up the QDT and you know, what the best advantage is uh, to being able to do that. So it's a tricky situation for sure. Okay. So uh, Valerie asked, if my son's grandma leaves the house to him, would he have to pay probate? I guess the son is um, uh, with disability, with autism. Yeah, so, um, so a couple of things. So the, the first is, um, you know, if, if the son is getting disability assistance um, and, and does have some, um, you know, uh, capacity functioning decision-making uh, uh, vulnerability, uh, we would want to talk to the grandma about how to leave the house to him. It would probably be much better for her to do that in a trust uh, than to have it go directly to him. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, making sure it keeps him eligible. It is, you, are, you can own a house um, as an exempt asset and still get PWD, uh, but even then it's still usually better to have a trust. If we were going to do it through a trust, then you know, the easiest way to do that would be through the estate and there would be some probate fees, but there are other ways to do it. Um, and so uh, because of the tax and probate fee and property transfer tax implications, um, I would say this would be a really good one to get and talk to someone specifically about because there's lots of little traps um, that uh, even, you know, a lawyer who doesn't do this all the time uh, might fall into um, without appreciating it. Um, so absolutely, it can be done. Uh, there are ways to minimize the costs and maximize the benefits, uh, but it will require some careful planning. Okay, this one is a little complicated. Thank you. So Laura asks, um, my aunt in Ontario left me a percentage of her estate and my mom is insisting I get a committee. Can I work alongside with them? And who decides who is the represent, uh, representative? Who the representative should be? Uh, also, uh, she said that she's an adult with a disability and her aunt made someone else her trustee to release her funds? Yeah, so, um, so I guess the first point is um, on your aunt's side, because she's in Ontario and because she's your aunt, um, she does have the ability to choose how she's going to leave an inheritance. So um, in British Columbia, 
um, if it were your mother and she was using her will, um, there is some ability to challenge um, that, uh, but uh, circumstances you've described, there would not be any default ability for you to uh, challenge that. So what we'd have to do is look at what the terms are of your aunt's will and how she has set that up. Um, and that would determine what your rights are under it. Um, and there may well be ways to um, you know, deal with what those rights are, uh, to be able to determine who should make the decisions and what your involvement might be able to be. Um, I, I'm not sure why your mum would be insisting on a committee because typically if there's a court trust and it sounds like there was uh, a trustee, um, then they would usually have that ongoing authority. However, if the um, will says to pay it out directly to you and doesn't impose a trust, um, then um, I think you do have an entitlement to insist on it being paid out to you. Um, they may look at it and say um, that they're not satisfied that you have the capacity to receive it yourself. That's maybe why your mom's suggesting the committeeship. Um, but by default, you are deemed to have capacity. Um, and so I'd be questioning, you know, why, um, why it is that they're asking for that committeeship. Um, so the short answer, Laura, is that it's a complicated situation. Um, and it really depends on what um, uh, your aunt's will says. Um, and you probably want to talk to someone um, who has the legal background to be able to give you good advice uh, about how to move forward in that situation. Um, and I did notice um, uh, there was someone who mentioned using NIDIS uh, to do representation agreements. And, and by all means, I think that's a great way uh, to do things. Um, so I'm not in any way suggesting that, um, that people can't do uh, self-help or uh, get things put in place that way. Um, I think there is value to having uh, a lawyer look at it, but we all have to each make our own decisions about um, you know, how we're going to put things in place. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Patricia asks, do you have a template letter that we can use to write to our MP about limitations with qualified disability trust and principal resident exemption for inter vivos trust? Ah, very good. That's a, that's a great question. I, I don't have a template letter. Um, um, I... I don't know off the top of my head, Patricia, whether um, Plan or the Disability Alliance uh, might have something that they've done. Um, there's another group called the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners that I know has made comments on that section, uh, but I don't know if they did a, uh, a template letter. Um, if you want to send me an email, um, I'd be happy to follow up with you to uh, see if I can put you in touch with the right resources for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. So all the questions are answered and it's uh, 12 o'clock. So we're right on time. And thank Perfect. you so much, Jeffrey, for sharing your expertise um, in the past two sessions, like today and also in April. Uh, everyone, if you have more questions, you are welcome to uh, contact Jeff uh, by email or call his office. And uh, you can also view this session again in our YouTube channel later today from later today or in a in a couple of days uh, we will we will make it uh, ready thank you so much Jeff thank you thanks so much. thanks everyone for uh, joining in mm -hmm. thanks everyone have a good afternoon a good weekend bye bye, bye.